Hi, welcome to another video. This is Mr. Chow from EnglishTuition.org. In today, we are going to go into a rather lengthy video uh, because we're going to go through some of the uh, most frequently asked questions. I have so many questions! And hopefully, I can provide you with some useful answers. So let's get started. Now, for situation writing, here is the first question. What types of tasks are included in situation writing? Now, at the primary level, there are only six uh, points, right, for the task. So just make sure that you go to the visual, identify the right information, do the working, right? Just go and underline or highlight, okay? And there should be six details, right? Six details for six marks. Next question. How is the situation writing marks? Now, besides the six marks, there, there are also nine marks that are awarded for the language component so make sure everything is in uh, as close to perfect grammar as possible spelling punctuation mistakes they all count right and using the right words for the right context uh, they all count towards the language scores what are the key elements of a well-written situational piece now in primary school you don't have to worry too much about whether you know about the tone the register and so on and so forth now they are important right but a lot of students tend to overthink it right and they start to learn more advanced situation writing pieces like uh, speeches reports incident reports etc okay i think uh, just focus on the key basic ones like writing emails right uh, and make sure that you know you're writing in uh, tone and register that's suitable for uh, the given question uh, for primary level most of the time is uh, informal right so uh, students don't have a lot of restrictions if you're writing uh, an informal situational piece okay next question what format should i be familiar with for situation writing and again it's not very important here just uh, take a look at how emails and letters are being written uh, you know for the primary level you know markers are not uh, looking out for whether you know the addresses are correct whether there's a uh, you know the format of the letter is correct or not okay they are looking for uh the details right the, the student read carefully and include uh the details that are being asked in the task for women section and whether the students can use basic language in a proficient manner all right how can i improve my situation writing skills um just practice right practice as many times as as you want you can use uh you know the past year papers you can use exam papers right from uh, other schools right they are available for download all over the internet you can use assessment books if you like all right uh, the important thing is to have someone vet through your answer someone to mark your answer so that you know that and you have some feedback that you are improving okay how important is vocabulary in situation writing quite important because you need to know how to spell certain words how to include some of your own words in order to make uh, the entire answer okay as coherent as possible all right so for those students with strong vocab you are definitely having an advantage here uh for those students who are weak in vocab uh for the situation writing that is not uh, that important yet because uh for situation writing the exercise is rather short so uh you may not expose your weaknesses here okay but still it is important to have good vocab since this is a language paper so do what you can uh, to strengthen your vocab can i include personal opinions in my situation writing the answer is yes but try not to include too many unnecessary details especially if your language is not so good you just introduce more mistakes all right just focus on the task make sure that all the tasks are there all the sentences are formed properly without grammatical errors and you are done okay how long should my situation writing response be now in the question, there, there are no minimum work count, maximum work counts that are being given or recommended. So typically, a good response should be somewhere around 200 to 250 words. Uh, do not uh, write you know, overly lengthy because you don't have a lot of time. Now, the situation writing exercise for the primary school paper is only uh, you know, worth um, a total of 50 marks out of 55. So you still have the composition to look at. So you don't want to spend... Uh, too much time right and write an overly lengthy uh, answer how can i manage my time effectively during my situation writing section well the most important tip i can give you is just be very focused on what you're supposed to do right just fulfill all the tasks write in complete sentences and you're more or less done okay no need to be uh, no trying to write a very impressive language 
right? Trying to uh, write a very lengthy introduction, a very lengthy conclusion, uh, which is not really necessary. Okay, so these all these tips can help you to save a lot of time for the situation writing section. Okay, now let's move on to the composition writing, okay, which is worth 40 marks. That's more than double the weightage, right, for the situational writing. First question, what types of prompts can I expect for my composition? Now, the, the prompts that are actually given in the question, they are not, they are very basic, okay, they are just there to help some of the weaker students uh, to brainstorm for ideas because some students don't even know what questions to ask themselves, right, if they are writing a story. So the prompts are very basic, so don't rely too much on them. Sometimes there are two prompts, sometimes there are three prompts. Uh, try to rely a bit more on the pictures. In any case, be yeah. reminded you are supposed to emphasize on at least one of the pictures. So if you just ignore all the pictures, then uh, you might be slightly penalized okay, for the composition. How is composition writing assessed in the PSLE? Now, 30 marks will be allocated for the storyline. Okay, so you want to make sure that the story is very interesting. Okay, the storyline, rising action, the climax, etc., etc., uh, they are all very logical, very sensible, and very interesting. Okay, that's how you score high for the uh, the storyline. Okay, and the other training marks is allocated for language. So, uh, do you use certain good words, good phrases, simile, metaphor, etc.? Uh, how about your sentence structure? Is there a, a varied enough right sentence structure or are you using the same sentence structures all the time uh grammar punctuation everything counts right and counts towards the uh 20 marks so total 40 marks what should i include in my composition okay by now you know before going into the exam hopefully you have gone through a lot of practices so you should include you know uh, at least an introduction okay you should include some form of brief introduction for your characters you should also include a very you know energetic climax very interesting climax for the composition as well and finally make sure you include a very logical conclusion right to resolve the situation and your job is done how can i generate ideas for my composition well read widely right and at the primary level i think most of the time you can actually get inspired just by reading other model compositions reading storybooks uh just activate your imagination so that will give you a lot of ideas, right, for your composition. So a lot of times when I notice my students, for those who are well read, and I give them a composition topic, almost straight away they can say, ah, I've read something similar somewhere before. Okay, so that's how they can come up with the ideas very quickly. All right, so but if you are not well read, then uh, obviously you may struggle a little bit. What is the recommended length for a PSR composition? Uh, my Personal recommendation is somewhere between 400 to 500 words. I know the minimum word count is only 150 words. So, but 150 words is just too little. And I've observed a lot of my students can go in excess of 300, even up to 400, 500 words. But writing 500 words is excessive, right? So unless your language is super strong, right? And you can write super fast without making too many mistakes, then by all means, you go for 500 words. But I don't think there's a need at the primary level to do so. Uh, it is more sensible to just go for around 300, maximum 350 words, so that you leave yourself more time, okay, to go and check through the mistakes, read through you know, the, the text again, make sure that there are no plot holes, uh, no, no language mistakes, etc., etc. Um, and also, uh, writing excessively, okay may mean that uh, you're not managing your time okay because to write a very lengthy psi composition takes a lot of time and you may just run out of time to have a proper conclusion okay how important is the storyline in narrative writing very important right as you know training marks go to the storyline so what you're trying to avoid is uh, to write a completely illogical story this man speaks nonsense uh that is why i do not recommend students who write you know 100% fictitious stories because that's when they let their imagination just run okay run wild and then you know that's where a lot of these uh, plot holes come in uh, and it, it doesn't lead to a good story try to focus on storylines that you have some uh, personal experiences in and then you just adjust and go along from there 
this is a better approach okay to uh, having a good storyline can i use dialogue in my composition uh, of course you can but make sure you don't use dialogue for the entire composition because then that will change it into a script for a play or something okay uh, you're not writing a skit you're writing a composition so use dialogue um, at the right time maybe you know uh, in the climax right somewhere where there are important moments and then you can use dialogue what writing techniques can i use to enhance my composition you can use uh, forewarning right to build up the suspense uh, you can include some uh, you know similes idioms etc try to include good phrases words adjectives uh, or expressions that you can recall from modern compositions that you have read in the past so all these techniques can help you to enhance your composition and make it uh, better all right how can i improve my language and grammar skills for composition writing now this takes time okay so if you're just revising uh the hard work is actually done over the years right uh what have you done to improve your grammar what have you done to improve your writing techniques have you gotten many rounds of feedback and all that takes time so even so if you're trying to improve uh you know your language and grammar skills uh, right before the examination, I highly recommend that you just go and choose some of the best best compositions right, that, that you have ever seen and then try to learn from there. So make sure you pick something that is just somewhere close to your level of language. Right? You don't want to choose a composition that is like far beyond you and then you cannot learn from it. Okay? So you want to choose those compositions that you think uh, you can still understand them right? and then try to learn the writing techniques from there. Should I write from my personal experience? So as mentioned, yes, you should write from personal experiences because most of the time, because you experience it yourself and the story is based on a true story, you are less likely to run into you know, plot holes or writing uh, you know, insensible things all right, in your composition. How do I manage my time effectively during the composition writing section? First of all, okay, you don't want to write an overly lengthy uh, composition. You want to make sure that you know you are well rehearsed, right? The 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 recommended length, uh, as mentioned, is somewhere between 300, 350, right? That's a that's the sweet spot. Do not spend too much time brainstorming, okay, for the ideas. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, maybe about five to ten minutes maximum. All right, then you need to start writing your composition, okay? Uh, make sure that you conclude the composition and leave yourself about five to ten minutes just for proofreading and checking so these are the tips that i can give you to manage your time effectively what common mistakes should i avoid in uh, composition writing now some students like to over exaggerate okay do not make it you know too dramatic okay <laughs> melodrama you know is uh you know for p6 uh it tends to lead to a lot of uh, logical errors okay and then uh instead of trying to make the composition more interesting it actually backfires next and i think this is just my personal opinion i think uh, many students try to you know use a very heavy storyline i think this is a mistake as well you know on the emotional level right a 12 year old kid right the student may not understand you know the certain events uh, that well yet all right so they may not appreciate the uh, emotional reactions and therefore they cannot write accurately about those incidents in the compositions so try to keep the story light-hearted all right delightful and so on uh then uh most likely the composition you know you don't have to have to have a very heavy plot okay for a premise six composition all right keep it light-hearted and uh, you should be able to do well in the composition how can i create a strong conclusion for my composition and I've seen students use uh, one-liners just because they run out of time or they run out of ideas. Uh, never do that. Okay, write a proper con uh, conclusion. What's a proper conclusion? Should be at least somewhere between four to five sentences. Uh, if you don't know what to write, then uh, write a reflection. All right, for your conclusion, what you have learned. Okay, from the incident. You you look great today. What resources can I use for practice? Uh, there are tons of resources. You can read storybooks. You can read uh, articles you know, on the internet. Uh, you can read uh, you know, model compositions. So my students, they have got access to uh, the compositions that I've written. So you can actually read uh, you know, compositions that are written by other people. Okay, So that uh, you, you get to learn uh, more ideas. They are, they are plentiful. You can go to the popular bookstores and uh, just buy 
you know, uh, browse through some of the model composition and just buy some of the better ones. Okay, next, let's move on to uh, paper two, where we are tackling booklet A and booklet B. Grammar MCQ. What types of grammar topics are covered in the MCQs? All types of grammar topics are covered, right? Most notably, you should get a few on like subject verb agreement. Uh, you should get prepositions, connectors, pronouns, etc. So uh, there's no escaping for grammar since it's a language paper. How do I effectively prepare for grammar MCQs? Just practice, right? Just buy uh, grammar MCQ assessment books and just practice plenty of MCQs. Just remember to do your working, okay? I've seen students who are just too lazy to do working and as a result, they make a lot of careless mistakes. What strategies can I use to tackle grammar MCQs? Uh, the most effective one is to use the uh, you know process of uh, el elimination. All right, just el eliminate all right some of the the uh, options. So, uh, but to do that, okay, you have to do your working, right? It brings us back to what we've just previously mentioned. Next question: Are there any specific grammar rules that I should focus on? You should focus on all of them, okay. In particular, the more important ones, uh, like subject verb agreement. Uh, just practice and practice and let me give you one quick tip right subject verb agreement uh sometimes students the mistakes they make is they only look for the subject at the beginning of the sentence now the subject can be at the back of the sentence after the verb all right so uh give an example uh, apples are red right so the apples is the subject and it's at the beginning of the sentence but if the sentence goes there are apples right then the apples is at the back and a lot of students, they always, they're so used to looking out for the subject, uh, you know, in front, right? That they forget to continue to read the rest of the sentence, okay? Can there be tricky questions in the grammar MCQs? Of course, there can be in any part of the paper, okay? So the workaround is, of course, to always read carefully uh, so that you don't get tricked by, by the questions uh, in the grammar MCQs. So, for example, uh, many students are just familiar with the simple past, simple present, right? And there are some tenses in you know, grammar that are not real tenses, right? So, for example, if I say, if I were you, and the, the reason why were is used is because it's impossible for me to be you. So, the verb were is not a real uh, simple past tense. So, this is an example of a tricky question in the grammar MCQ. How much time should I allocate to the grammar MCQ? Uh, typically for grammar MCQ is about one to two minutes per question. What should I do if I'm unsure about an answer? Now, if you're unsure, like as in just a small percentage of you know that you're unsure, right? Just 40, 50 percent you're unsure. What I recommend is just you write down the answer, just go and shade the uh, OAS. Um, but if you're hundred percent unsure, then you just mark down in pencil or something, okay, next to the question. And make sure that you come back to it later, right? Don't go and spend like five, ten minutes to try to work out the answer at this uh, very early stage. What common mistakes should I avoid in grammar MCQs? Right, that just just do your working, okay? I cannot stress this, stress this enough, right? And uh, read the entire lines carefully, right? The entire question, right? The entire sentence carefully, okay? Don't just jump to conclusion just because you read the first part of the sentence. Can I improve my grammar skills through group study or discussion? Uh, yes, of course, the more you use the language, the more you will improve. Uh, group study or discussions at the primary level, I don't think, you know, these students, you know, you can organize it yourself. So uh, try to have somebody lead the group study or discussion, right? Uh, you know, it could be, you know, your teacher or your tutor or even a parent, okay? Or senior uh, secondary level student, okay? Uh, because these, pe these people are able to provide more value during the, the study discussion and you have questions, you can always ask them. Next, we are moving on to vocabulary. MCQ. How many vocab questions? Now, within Broker A, there are a total of 10 marks that are for uh, the uh, vocab MCQ. Okay, so just try to score as many marks as you can. Next question, how do I effectively prepare for vocab MCQ? Uh, generally speaking, you know, parents always ask me uh, how to improve uh, the vocab, right, for this section, because sometimes students can score zero, okay? And uh, that's because they have, they have no vocab at all. They are just very ignorant. They have no knowledge. And why is that the case? That's because they are not learning, okay? And how can they learn? 
So the way to effectively prepare is there's just so many ways uh, is to make the learning process more enjoyable. You don't want to open up a dictionary to just study because that's just, uh, you know, uh, trying to use your memory. Okay, and uh, it's not very enjoyable, it's very dry. So what you want to do is to read stories, interesting stories, in interesting articles, right? Even if you play uh, games that are in English, okay, then you will definitely pick up some vocab from there, okay? And then because you've heard the phrase before um, in the games, in the apps, uh, in the podcast, uh, you will definitely improve your language. What strategies can I use to tackle uh, vocabulary MCQs? Now, vocab MCQs, we don't always walk into the exam hall knowing 100% of the words in the exam paper, right? So it's only natural that, you know, some of the vocab uh, MCQs you've never seen before, right? Some of the options. So it's very important that you have certain strategies to help you tackle the vocab MCQs. And one of the most effective ones is to use contextual clues. Read uh, the surrounding text, surrounding sentences carefully. Try to understand what is happening and then think, okay, in this particular context, what is the best word or phrase? that suits you know, the passage, okay? So that's one good strategy that you can use. Are there frequently recurring vocab themes in the PSLE? Definitely, yes, right? Words, phrases that are related to school themes, right? Uh, you know, what is happening in school and what's happening at home, what is happening uh, to daily activities. Uh, these are some of the recurring uh, vocab themes. Uh, so generally speaking, we look through the past year papers uh, the vocab that are being tested are considered quite fair, okay? So if students read widely, okay, they should not have to worry about this section at all. Can there be tricky questions in the vocabulary MCQ? The answer is yes. Some of the options that are being given, they deliberately make the uh, answers you know, look very similar, right? For example, the spelling of the words, all the four words are very similar, right? Uh, uh, they always start with RE, for example, resilient resistance resonate all right and so on and therefore students can get easily confused so please read the uh, vocab uh, the options carefully before selecting your answers how important is reading for improving uh, vocabulary skills very very important okay next question <laughs> what should i do if i'm not familiar with a word in a vocab mcq well like i said this is very common right when you are trying to answer vocab questions just do your best to use contextual clues to answer the question. How can I improve my vocabulary over time? Like I said, there are just so many ways to improve your vocabulary over time. Uh, you want to make sure that every day, every week, right, you are doing something to expose yourself to new words, new vocab. And every time you come across a new word, make a conscious effort to try and look for the meaning. Go and search for the meaning. Now these students, you all have handphones, right? So let's take out your handphone and search for the meaning and you will improve over time. Are idioms included in vocabulary MCQs? The answer is yes. There's no guarantee, right, that you know, it will not be included. So it's good that for some of the common idioms, uh, just uh, be familiar with them. How much time should I allocate to the vocab MCQ section? Uh, as always, for most MCQ, it's about one or two minutes per question. Now, it's very easy to get hung up on one question in the vocab because you don't know the, the words, right? But you can spend half an hour, an hour, and you still won't know the words, right? It doesn't make sense to spend too much time on one question, right? If you don't know the answer, just move on, and you have some spare time, you can always come back later, all right? What common mistakes should I avoid in vocab MCQs? Uh, a lot of students don't read the options carefully, one, two, three, four, and try to understand the nuances between the four options. And they just, you know, if they just see the first option, second option, and then just very hastily I'm growing impatient Write down the answer and therefore make careless mistakes Okay, so do read all the options carefully before you choose Are there recommended resources for practicing uh, vocabulary MCQs? So if you want to challenge yourself and practice And again, you can always refer to past year papers uh, These are for PSLE, alright uh, For past year papers from other school exams, okay run through all the vocab uh, you can use vocab list right uh, if you buy certain assessment books they come with the glossary page <laughs> at the back uh, you can use those to boost your vocabulary okay next let's move on to the visual comprehension and that's the last part of booklet a question what types of visuals can i expect in the visual comprehension section 
So this can be a variety, it can be a map, it can be some charts, it can be a board game. Uh, it depends, right? Uh, you, it's just almost impossible to try and uh, predict what visual will come out, but these are some of the common types. How many visual comprehension MCQs are a total of 8, right? Only 8 marks. What skills are tested in visual comprehension MCQs? They are mostly reading skills, right? Because you are not expected to form your answer, it's MCQ. Uh, you only have to choose the correct answer, right? So what you need to do is to make sure that you understand the question, right? And you understand the information that's been presented in the uh, visual comprehension because they are images and text. So the skills require a little bit different. Okay, uh, so what you want to do is to just go to the uh, the visual itself, okay, and annotate, do as much working as you can so that you understand exactly what is happening in the visual. How should I approach a visual comprehension question? Now, most of the time, uh, just read the entire visual once over and read the questions once over before you even uh, attempt to uh, give the answers. Most of the time in the visual, you should be able to see how the information is uh, being organized, okay? So that will help you to quickly identify certain answers, right? So if they're asking for uh, certain uh, details uh, and you know that that is presented in the text section, right? So you just jump to the text, right? And for certain questions, if you know, the information can only be found in the, the, Im the images, then uh, you know to just go to that part of the image to, to just uh, go and look for the answers. So that's a good way to approach the visual comprehension. What strategies can I use to improve my visual comprehension skills? Just uh, practice a variety of visuals, right? Don't just practice one or two types. Uh, just expand your experience, right? Uh, try as many types as possible and that will seriously help you to improve your visual comprehension skills. Now, this section for information is not very difficult. For the students with uh, stronger language abilities, they can score easily, uh, 7 upon 8, 8 of 8. So if you're not doing this exercise uh, properly, okay, and you're scoring like 4 upon 8, then you need to improve your reading skills, right? your comprehension skills. Can context from accompanying text influence the answers to visual comprehension questions? Well, uh, the answer is definitely yes. Again, read with comprehension that's the main objective right so you're looking at the pictures uh you're just enjoying you know <laughs> the way the pictures are being drawn <laughs> then you're not doing your job all right you must try to understand the message that is being conveyed in both the images and the text and they're actually related ideas okay so uh just try to draw your understanding from the context what common mistakes should i avoid in visual comprehension mcqs now i notice that a lot of times students just hate you know, reading uh, the visual carefully. So a lot of times they make mistakes in the true or false questions, right? Uh, that's where they are required to just match the information in the options one, two, three, four, with the information given in the visual, okay? And they must try to understand the option first, right? Before they can do the matching, okay? So students, uh, you know, they just don't read carefully and as a result, they make a lot of uh, careless mistakes. Uh, you can also expect some vocabulary questions uh, so another common mistake is they don't focus on the keywords and as a result, uh, they choose the wrong answer. Okay, so always try to focus on the keywords, not just in the visual, but also in the question and in the options. All right. How can I practice for the visual comprehension MCQ? So as mentioned, just go out there, you know, get your hands on as many practices as you can and just complete them. All right. Are there specific techniques for analyzing charts and graphs? Now, if you're presented with charts, graphs, uh, maps, uh, just pay attention to the headings, the subheadings. So, for example, if it's a pie chart, right, then you might want to pay attention to the different parts of the pie chart. If it is a graph, then you might want to pay attention to uh, the uh, the axis itself, right? Uh, then you know that uh, this is how you draw meaning uh, from all these diagrams. Next question, how important is attention to detail in visual comprehension? Uh, the answer is very very important okay so what do you mean by detail in visual comprehension so it could be the answer you know is in a small piece of text right a small uh, phrase that is hidden somewhere at the bottom of the visual okay as soon as just miss that and uh, you know when they ask uh, the question and then they go to the visual and they look at the visual they only notice all the the big items and you know, all those attention catching items 
and they ignore the details. So that's how they miss the answer, right? And so every time, you know, when students make such mistakes, you know, I ask them to look at the visual again. And sometimes even looking at it multiple times, uh, they still cannot find it, all right? So this comes with practice and experience as well. Can questioning techniques help in uh, visual comprehension? So what I mean by questioning techniques is, I think questioning, questioning techniques, students need to question themselves as they read the visual, right? For example, if you see a picture, they ask themselves, uh, what is this uh, picture referencing? Okay, what is it representing? Okay, now by asking themselves this question, they can help themselves understand the visual better and as a result, uh, you know, do better for the exercise. Are visuals sometimes combined with text uh, for MCQs? Well, the answer is yes. Typically, it's about 60% images and about 40% text. So students will, will need to try to combine all, right, all, all the information and try to understand the visual as much as possible. Now, how much time should I allocate to visual comprehension MCQ? Now, to read the questions and answer the question about one to two minutes, but you also need about five to eight minutes, okay, or give yourself 10 minutes, okay, to try and really digest the visual, okay? So, all in all, uh, somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes, right, for the exercise. Now, let's move on to booklet B, Grammar Close. Question, how many grammar close questions should I expect in the PSLE English paper? Uh, it's a 10 questions, right? And you're given helping words, right? Uh, usually, you no know, A, B, C, D, you just choose from the options, right? And uh, most of my students who are strong, they can get 8 upon 10, 10 upon 10, full marks even, right? For this section, so it's not very difficult. Okay, next question, what types of grammar concepts are commonly tested in the grammar close questions? Um, all kinds of grammar topics are included, but mostly uh, very common ones, right? Like pronouns, connectors, prepositions. Uh, this is the part where students need to have a very strong foundation in order to do well. And overall, the exercise itself, like I said, is not very difficult. Huh? You can score close to full marks for that. Are the blanks in grammar gross questions always the same type of word? Uh, well, not always. Um, I think students tend to have difficulty with certain prepositions. Uh, don't overlook prepositions, okay? How should I approach filling in the blanks for the grammar close questions? Uh, well, you should try to just fill in the confident answers and use the process of elimination, but be prepared to make corrections and adjustments, yeah. right? For example, if you select A for your first answer and you continue writing, okay, doing the exercise and you realize that the answer for the last blank could also be A. So then what you do, right? So now you have two blanks that are competing for the one for the same answer, right? Uh, so you might need to go back to the first blank and change. So a lot of students, uh, you know, once they fill in the answer, they are just not willing to go back and revisit and change the answer. Uh, that will result in you know a lot of uh, marks being lost, uh, which should not be happening. Okay. Is it important to pay attention to context when answering grammar close questions? Yes, yes, the answer is yes, right? Context is always important. Okay, always ask yourself what is happening within the grammar close and uh, as much as possible, use the context to help you to arrive at the correct answers. What strategies can I use to improve my performance on grammar close? Again, you can use el elimination, right? Um, you can use contextual clues. So these are some of the common strategies. Um, and because this exercise is just like not too difficult, let's not spend a lot of time on it. Can I use the process of elimination to help choose answers for closed questions? And you already know the answer to this. The answer is yes. The thing is a lot of students don't want to do working again, right? So it's just a you know, small cross. You don't have to spend a lot of time like try to you know, cancel out the whole, you know, do a bit, a lot of shading and waste time, right? That's not what I'm asking you to do, right? Just put a tick or a cross. And you can easily do some simple working for the close uh, component. What common mistakes should I avoid in uh, grammar close questions? Well, not a lot of common mistakes. Uh, unless students mis misread okay, the, the, the text, uh, they just uh, rush to conclusion that one of the options is the correct answer when they have not looked at all the, um, all the helping words that are available to them. All right. So sometimes, uh, let me give you an example of common mistake. So if you don't want to do working, right, and one of the answer is a pronoun, but you do not know whether the pronoun is a singular one or a plural one. So what do you do? You go to the text, right, to look for the clue. So if you see 
you know, a group of boys with an S, then you know there's a plural and you're going to use a pronoun like they, them, or they are, right? And it would eliminate all the options for the singular pronouns, right? So this is an example of uh, one of a common mistake in the grammar close uh, passage, right? Other specific tips for managing my time while answering grammar close questions. Just uh, read carefully, no need to rush through. Uh, try to answer all the questions confidently. And uh, again, be reminded, be prepared to go back and make uh, corrections if needed. What should I do if I encounter a blank that I'm unsure about? You can easily skip that. And because you eliminate all the other options, you already narrow down to a few final choices. So that can help you to arrive at the correct answer. Now next, let's talk about booklet B. Okay, and we start with uh, editing. Editing, um, how many editing exercise questions are typically included in the PSLE English paper? Uh, 12. Now, the editing exercise is uh, worth 12 marks. Okay? There are six grammar, yeah. usually, usually, uh, not guaranteed. Okay? Usually, there are six grammar mistakes and around six uh, spelling mistakes. So, the editing can be for grammar and spelling. Now, for uh, grammar, uh, the spelling is correct. Okay, it's only the uh, there's something grammatically wrong with the mistake and they will already have shown you what the mistake is so you don't need to go and find and circle that's for secondary level okay so but for spelling the word that has been given to you is 100% is the wrong spelling now most of the time they will try to match uh, come up with a similar sounding word with the correct answer so that you, you can guess and make an accurate guess as to what the answer is all right what kind of errors are generally found in editing exercises, right? Only two, grammar and spelling. Next. Is there a time limit for completing the editing exercise? Again, allocate about... I think you could... You, you can find it. So a lot of times for editing exercise, you either know the answer or you don't know the answer, right? Uh, sometimes you may write, need to write out the words a few times in order to arrive at the correct spelling. So try not to take more than a minute for a question, okay? Where can I practice editing exercises outside of school? Okay, plenty of opportunities. Just go and grab all the assessment books in the bookstores. Okay, and again, you can try past your papers, right, from other schools as well. Okay, booklet B. Open-ended close. Now, this is a very interesting exercise. Um, usually, there are 15 blanks, right? They are typically included in the comprehension close exercise, so it's worth a total of 15 marks. For the stronger students, a good rule of thumb is to score at least 11 or 12 out of 15. So if you're failing this exercise, I think you really need to go and practice uh, your reading and your comprehension. Uh, students who are weak in vocab will suffer at this as well because they do not know the words that are supposed to go into the sentences, right? What is considered a good score? Like I said, anything above 11, 12 would be good. Okay, very few students can score full marks, but it is still possible. All right. How should I approach a comprehension close exercise effectively? Now, most of the time, you want to look out for contextual clues and again do working, right? Draw some arrows, right? So uh, use your grammar to help you, right? For example, if you see the subject at the beginning of the sentence followed by a blank, then you know that's likely to be a verb. Okay, and please make sure to check your tenses as well to make sure that the grammar is correct. What strategies can help me choose the correct words for the blanks? Now, since this is an open-ended comprehension exercise, again, you need to look at the context and try to understand the overall story. And Check this out. I realize a lot of students don't like to do that. Uh, they even try to fill in the answers before they complete reading the sentence, okay? So as a result, they make a lot of mistakes because those words do not fit into the blanks. Now, another strategy that students should use is that try to come up with multiple possible answers for the same blank so that you are able to choose the most suitable one. So what students like to do is to they, they just choose the first word that comes to mind uh, and that's usually the wrong answer. And they don't give themselves more uh, possible options. So that's another strategy that you can adopt. What can I do if I'm unsure about a word to fill in a blank? Uh, again, it's easy to get hung up on the blanks because now there's no helping words, right? Nothing to help you. 
uh, and you cannot write a phrase. I cannot add prepositions. Uh, you know, just because that's the only phrase that come to mind. Only one word per blank. Now, if you're really unsure, then please skip. Okay, don't get hung up and waste too much time. Right, you waste one or two marks is better than you waste ten marks. Right, because you don't have time to complete uh, the entire paper. How can I improve my skills in comprehension close exercises? Again, try as much as possible to practice close exercises and take a look at your score. Now, if you're not scoring well for the exercises, try to find out why you're not able to come out with the correct answers. Uh, it's always good to have a study partner, right? Or a mentor or, or a tutor in this case, right? Because they are able to give you some valuable feedback. Sometimes they can give you some useful hints and that will help you with your progress, okay? With mastering this uh, comprehension close exercise. Next, let's move on to Booker B Sentence Synthesis. Now, this is another component that a lot of students fear. Okay, what types of sentences might I need to synthesize? Well, most of the time, you know, there are two similar sentences that are provided, and just you just need to combine them. But sometimes it, you could just you know, be presented with one sentence and you're supposed to synthesize and change uh, the structure of the sentence. Okay, next question. Can I change the structure of the original sentences during synthesis? The answer is yes, but make sure that it's grammatically correct and depending on what is the connector right, that's being given to you. How can I practice sentence synthesis effectively? Uh, go and try out a variety of sentence synthesis exercises. Go and study the connectors, right? You need to understand how to use those connectors properly before you can, uh, you know, know how to use them to combine the sentences, right? So what I realized is that a lot of students, they just jump into using certain connectors, right? Like, uh, you know, unless, okay, or neither nor, either or, but they never read the notes or they're not been taught, okay? And as a result, they don't know how to use it correctly. And this mistake can, can also come out in the writing practice as you try to use certain connectors, but you use them wrongly, okay? So try to practice more often. Next question, what should I avoid when synthesizing uh, sentences? Well, you should avoid adding your own words, avoid adding unnecessary words. You should also avoid removing words unnecessarily, right? Um, a lot of students like to just remove certain prepositions or articles, and do not remove them, right? Or certain pronouns even, okay? Because when you remove this word, sometimes you introduce grammar mistakes. Sometimes you change the meaning. Okay, so when you change the meaning, uh, you cannot be awarded the marks uh, for this exercise. How much time should I allocate for the sentence synthesis section in the PSLE English exam? Uh, because you have to write out the full answer, typically spend about two to three minutes for each question. And if there are a total of five questions in the exam, uh, so that works out to be about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for this exercise. Um, typically, my students, they finish less than that. So about 10 minutes, right? Paper 2, booklet B, open-ended comprehension. Now, this exercise is worth a total of 20 marks. What types of texts are typically used in open-ended comprehension? They are usually narratives, meaning they are based on stories. So they may be characters, dialogues, etc., etc., they're usually interesting uh, and uh, I find it quite enjoyable to uh, you know, tackle the open-ended co comprehension. Next question. How should I approach answering open-ended comprehension questions? Now, the recommended approach is uh, trying to read the text at least once and then read the full set of questions once as well. Then after that, go back and read uh, the passage the second time. Right, This time, pay more attention to the main ideas. Now you can start answering the question. When you start to answer the question, you're already reading the passage for the third time, right? Because this time you're looking for the details and those are the details that are being asked by the questions, right? So usually it takes like at least two or three attempts to read the passage before you can find the answer. So uh, that's the recommended approach. What are some common question types in uh, open-ended comprehension? Now, PSLE, I think uh, it's quite common to encounter the same type of question types like information transfer, uh, like uh, true or false questions, right? And you're given a table and asked, you know, whether the statements are true or false and you're required to write answers, uh, like sequencing, questions like referencing as well. Uh, so these are all the common question types. 
So it's definitely possible for students to really go and practice and be familiar with all the question types before sitting for the exam. What strategies can I use to improve my open-ended comprehension skills? Um, again, one of the most basic pieces of advice that are given by a lot of school teachers is to annotate the text, right? Because annotating can help prevent a lot of careless mistakes. It can also help students locate and find the answers very quickly. Okay, so but a lot of students don't like to do that because whenever I receive the scripts back from some of my students, uh, the exam paper is very clean, uh, no annotations at all. So this is one of the most basic strategies. Now, another strategy that students can use, okay, is uh, again, look for contextual clues. Most of the time, okay, nowadays uh, in modern comprehension passages, students don't need to, you, know, you will not be sent to you know, all over the place, right, to just go and look for the correct answers. Most of the time, they will give you hints or even tell you exactly, roughly, where the answers will be, okay? So, just uh, go to that particular paragraph or the specified lines and then try to locate the answers from there, right? That's another uh, important strategy that students can use. Is there a recommended length for my answers? Uh, the answer is no, uh, but usually, don't go and base your answers on whether my, my answers are long enough or not. Always think whether my answers are relevant and complete or not, right? So if you require to write three lines just to have a complete answer, then by all means, go and write three lines, right? So, but if that's not necessary, you only need one line, then you just write a very short answer, that's fine. What you don't want to do is to try and you think the answer is too long and then you go and summarize, okay? Then that would be a mistake because when you summarize, you're going to miss out some important details and you're going to get wrong okay, for the answer, okay? Can I express my personal opinion in open-ended comprehension questions? The answer is yes, but only for personal response answers. And even then, your answer must be supported by evidence from the passage. Okay, If your answers are not supported by evidence, uh, then you will not be awarded the mark. What should I avoid when answering open-ended uh, comprehension questions? I think one important thing that students must understand is that you must try to avoid making personal assumptions when you attempt to do this exercise, right? A lot of students I work with, sometimes when they read the story, they take it very personal, right? And then they start to you not know, think of what they would do if they are the character, right? They put themselves in the shoes of the character. Uh, and then they start to have answers, right? That uh, as a personal response. So uh, that's what you should not do when trying to approach the open-ended comprehension questions because your answers must always, always, always be based on the text. You must always reference the text. So do avoid uh, giving your own assumptions, right? Or jumping to conclusions, right? Or making certain decisions on behalf of the characters when it is not clearly stated in the passage itself, okay? So that's what students must avoid. Next question, how can I handle difficult passages or unfamiliar vocabulary in open-ended question? I think this is a very good question because a lot of times uh, students are faced with complex, difficult or confusing passages, right? For example, you could have uh, you know, the character and then within the story itself, you have the character's mother. And then the character's mother has got another mother, which is the character's grandmother. So who is the mother, right? And who is the grandmother, right? And the character also has a daughter. So now it becomes very confusing. All right, so you need to have certain strategies for dealing with confusing passages. So what I personally like to do is to just, you know, advise my students to just uh, go and, you know, create some form of simple diagrams or break down the text to simplify the passage so that they can understand the text fully before they even attempt the question. Now, but what about unfamiliar vocabulary? So again, this one, you must use your contextual clues. So you see this word contextual clues being mentioned so often in this video, right? So then yeah. you will start to realize that it's actually one of the essential skills for the paper. And if you don't have that, it is very difficult for you to do well in a language paper, right? Always try to understand the meaning behind the words, right? It's not just read the words itself. Now, with that said, okay, we have finally come to the end of the video. Yay! Okay, it has taken me quite some time uh, to uh, you know, count the questions and record the video. 
So hopefully I find this uh, video useful to you and that you have managed to stumble upon this video in a timely manner uh, just in time right to revise for your PSRE English examination. Now you're serious about uh, you know improving your English and wish to sign up for lessons you know where to find me EnglishTuition.org and I sincerely wish that you do well in your PSLE English examination and I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.